Hello, welcome to chapters four and five. Um, chapters four and five are going to be a little bit more intense, um, and this is going to have to do with how the biological molecules that we're made of work and what makes them function the ways that they do. Um, so very, very important chapter to understand. Definitely come to me with questions if you have any, which you probably will because this is a tough chapter. Okay, so the one that we're going to, the element that we're really going to concentrate on a lot is going to be carbon. And that's because carbon is the base of biological molecules. So you may have heard the term organic before. Um, what an organic molecule is, is it's something that has carbon in it. Um, so when we talk about bonding, and we're going to do some of this in lab, carbon likes to have four bonds around it. And that has to do with its valence electrons. Um, going along with that, nitrogen usually wants to have three. Oxygen likes to have two. And then hydrogen likes to have one. I don't know if you can see that, but that's going to be the way that they like to be set up. So if you remember in class, um, I have drawn this molecule. This is methane, CH4. And if we look at the rules, that makes sense, right? Carbon has four bonds around it, and each hydrogen only has one bond. So we're going to play around with molecule sets to kind of make sure that that makes sense, but that's how that's going to work. So biological molecules are going to involve all of those elements and plus a couple of more, obviously. And they're going to have different characteristics that are going to make them unique. So one thing about carbon is that carbon can um, form skeletons of these biological molecules. And there's a couple of ways that the skeletons can look. So if you see here, you can see that we have what are called linear, which are like these up here, this one here, this one here, and this one. You can also have branching, which is like this one right here. And then you can have a ring structure, which is there. Okay, so those are basically going to be the three ways that they can form their skeletons. Now, what I like about this picture here is it actually shows you this next to it. You see these polygons next to it. And if you compare that to the basic structure of that carbon skeleton, you can see it matches it. And here you can see the double bonds are in the same place. So your book often will draw just this, and they want you to assume that every point has a carbon, unless otherwise noted, and hydrogen's coming off of it. So just so you're aware of how that works. Okay, back to the notes. So um, hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbon, if you look at that word, is hydrogen and carbon together. And so um, hydrocarbons are going to make up the bulk of fats and things like that that we're going to talk about later. But um, that's going to be a really important um, aspect of fats, actually, and why they act the way they do. Hydrocarbons tend to be nonpolar. So if you remember, we talked about polarity in the last chapter. So think about polar versus nonpolar. Would a nonpolar substance be able to dissolve in water? It, you should be thinking no, right? And that's because nonpolar and polar, when you mix them together, there's no attraction, and so they stay separated. <clears throat> okay, now this next part is one that gives people a lot of grief, and that's going to be what are called functional groups. Um, functional groups are going to be something you can add onto a molecule that will all of a sudden give that molecule new properties, okay? So um, the thing you want to remember about functional groups is whatever functional group they are, they're going to have a job, and that job is the same no matter where they go or what they attach to. So that's super important to remember about that. So the first one that we're going to talk about is called a hydroxyl group. And the hydroxyl group looks like this. It's an OH. And its job is to make a molecule polar. Okay. So what I mean by that is, let's say that we have some sort of substance that we need to get to dissolve in water. And let's say that that substance is nonpolar. What we could do is take this OH and actually attach it to that molecule, and that would make it polar so that it could dissolve in water. Okay, so you may have heard of like water-soluble this, right? That's where that's coming from, is it probably has this on it to help it dissolve. Now if we go on to this next one, 
The carbonyl group, <clears throat> the, bol the job of a carbonyl group, first of all, it's carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, and its job is to make things nonpolar, okay? And carbonyls are going to be used for things that we say are fat soluble, right? Because fats are nonpolar. So vitamins and things like that might have this added onto it so that it will dissolve in fat, okay? Now, one thing over here, these are going to be the names of the um, molecules when they have that functional group attached to them. So going back to that hydroxyl group, you can see anything that has a hydroxyl on it is going to be called an alcohol, okay? So here with the carbonyl group, if that C double bonded to an O is on the end of a compound, we call it an aldehyde. And if it's in the middle of a compound, we call it a ketone. And I think I've got a picture. Let's see if I can, yeah, no, that's not it. Uh, here we go. Um, so here you can see that this carbonyl group is in the middle of this molecule, so we call that a ketone. And if you see here, it's hanging off the end of a molecule, and so that's called an aldehyde. So that's how you can tell the difference with those. So the job for those is to make a molecule uh, nonpolar so it could dissolve uh, like in fat or something nonpolar. Next one, a carboxyl group. A carboxyl group is going to make a solution more acidic. Okay, and the way it's going to do that is it's going to throw off this H right here. So it's a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and then it's also double uh, bonded to um, an oxygen and a hydrogen over here. So what happens is this hydrogen can be picked off and put into a solution, and as we learned last time, when you add H to a solution, that makes it more acidic, right? Um, now, one thing I want to point out is, and this is going to come up again and again in this class, is I say it's a proton donor. I should say it's an H plus donor because that's what I'm talking about here. So let's talk about why H and a proton are the same thing. So um, if we were going to look on the periodic table, hydrogen looks something like this, right? So it's got an atomic number of 1, and it's got an atomic mass of 1.00097, right? So if we were going to round that, we'd round it to 1. So if I ask you how many protons something has, for this, we would say it has 1 because its atomic number is 1, right? Now, if we tried to figure out the number of neutrons, well, 1 minus 1 is 0, so it doesn't have any neutrons. But it does have one electron, right? So here's our one electron. However, what do things with one electron in their outermost shell tend to do? They give them away, right? So if we do that, what's left is just a proton. So hydrogen and proton, you can use those interchangeably as far as talking about that. Okay. Um, so anything that has a carboxyl group is going to make a solution more acidic, and it's going to be called a carboxylic acid if it has that group attached to it. Whoops, I've got all new buttons on this computer. All right. Um, next one is the amino functional group. An amino group is going to be a proton acceptor in a solution. So what does that mean? That means it's going to gather up H pluses. Well, if you remember, if that happens, we're lowering the H plus which means we're probably um, increasing the OH minus solution, and so that's going to make the solution more basic. So um, basically, this nitrogen can handle another hydrogen, and that's what it's going to do. So anything that has the amino group on it is called the amines. Okay. Next group, sulfhydryl. Hopefully that should be pretty um, obvious. Um, so that's going to be made of sulfur and hydrogen. And what that's going to do is that's going to help stabilize proteins. So proteins actually look like a ball of yarn all kind of jumbled up. And in order to stay jumbled up like that in that perfect position, um, sulfhydryl groups are going to be there to kind of bridge that little gap between them. So we'll talk about that in lab when we actually do protein folding. Um, and then the last one, oh, I'm sorry, and sulfhydryls, if they're on something, we call them thiols. Then the last one is going to be, or second to last one, is a phosphate group, and that's going to be PO4 that you see here. And so anything that has that attached to it is going to be called an organic phosphate. When this sits by itself, it's called an inorganic phosphate. 
And so this one is going to be really important. This is actually what's keeping you alive right now and allowing you to do all of your muscle twitches and everything that you do. And so its job is to transfer energy. Very, very, very important in something called ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, which we'll get into later. Then the last group is going to be the methyl group. And the methyl group is going to act similarly to carbonyls. We'll go back and I'll show you what I mean by that. And so it's going to be um, carbon with three hydrogens coming off of it. And if it's attached to something, we call that a methylated compound. Now let's go back to carbonyls. There they are. And what we said the job of a carbonyl group was, was to make something nonpolar. So the same for that methyl group. It's going to do the same thing. Okay. So I just want to show you some pictures here of, um, yeah, this will work. Let's see if I can get it to come up. Maybe not. Um, so if you look here, I've highlighted in a darker color the functional group that we're interested in. Okay. So what I'm going to do is like on an exam, I might show you a big molecule, but I will have shaded in the area that I want you to concentrate on and say, what property does this molecule have with this functional group attached to it? So I'm not going to have you look at just some huge molecule and pick them out. I'm going to have it shaded so I'm kind of guiding you in the right direction. Okay, so those are functional groups. Now the next part we're going to talk about um, making and breaking macromolecules. So we'll stop here and then that'll be the next video.